And taking a look at the long-range forecast, continued snow, darkness, and extreme cold. This is Howard Handupme. Good night. As we discuss in many past videos, sometimes writers like to sneak in fairly dark themes in otherwise family-friendly shows. These could be in the form of what-if plots, dream sequences, or just a simple detail in the background. But other times, the golden opportunity arises, allowing them to go really dark without any repercussions. That opportunity is a series finale, when the show is already ending. Why not end things with a bang? Or maybe a depressing cry for clarity. I suppose we'll find out, as we go over 7 surprisingly dark series finales and kid-friendly shows. Eddie dreams up the entire show. Our first entry isn't exactly the last episode of the series, but it was planned to be at one point. Take this Ed and Shove It, the final episode of the fourth season of Ed and Eddie, is about Eddie discovering that the kids of the cul-de-sac are getting older and are not interested in his usual shtick anymore. As Double D explains that the kids will soon begin to think about their future careers, Eddie gets an idea on how to make money off of them. Career counseling. Things go wrong, as usual. Good morning, patients. I'm Dr. Naz, dentist. <laughs> First things first, dudes. Jawbreakers are so bad for your teeth. Cavities and stuff? Totally! <laughs> there. Now let's do this. And a bunch of heavy items in Eddie's garage end up hitting him on the head, causing him to black out. When he wakes up, he finds out that he is now 90 years old. This can't be happening! <laughs> Loss of control is the first thing to go, Eddie! He runs around the cul-de-sac in horror, finding that each kid is now old and senile as well. He tracks down his old jawbreakers, believing them to be the key to his youth. Unfortunately, Ed sneezes on the jawbreakers, turning them to dust. Eddie repeatedly smacks himself with his cane, until he eventually wakes up as a kid again. But after attempting to eat the jawbreaker, he wakes up in his old, old body. It seems you dozed off again there, Eddie. You were recounting yet another humorous story from our past when we were children. It was all just stories? Memories from the past? We really are old! Revealing the entire sequence, the entire show maybe, to all just be a dream. This episode was intended to be the series finale, but due to the show's massive popularity, it was renewed for two more seasons and a TV movie. There are a few deleted scenes that can be found online that hint at a more darker series finale. In the initial version of the scenes where Eddie discovers that he's become an old man, he believes it to just be a joke, like in the old cartoons. However, he begins to panic when he realizes that it's not a joke, and he pleads for Mr. Antonucci to wake him up. Mr. Antonucci is referring to Danny Antonucci, the creator of the series, and when he doesn't reply, Eddie begins to freak out. leading us to believe that the entire series and Antonucci himself were just dreamed up by Eddie, who is now figuring that out for himself. Again, it's a rather dark realization, and a meta one at that. However, the scene was cut, the show continued, and we're left with a pretty standard all-a-dream episode. Oh well, maybe it's for the best that cartoon characters don't become too self-aware. On another note regarding this episode, it was the last cartoon in history to be completely done in traditional cell animation, right down to the ink and paint. Edda and Eddie was the last major animation production to use traditional process, and the studio switched over to digital coloring starting with the Christmas special, Ed, Ed and Eddie's Jingle Jingle Jangle, the next episode made. The Power Rangers are defeated, and Zordon is kidnapped. Our next entry is sort of an exception. While it is technically the series finale, it leads directly into the next series, continuing the story and wrapping up any dark cliffhangers that this series ends on. The Power Rangers franchise is known for changing the title of the show each season, while still technically being one ongoing series. Things get a bit dire in the series finale of Power Rangers Turbo, titled Chase in a Space. This episode set up the final season in the original Power Rangers saga, named the Zordon era by fans. This encompasses Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers, Power Rangers Zeo, 
Power Rangers Turbo, and Power Rangers in Space. Usually in shows like Power Rangers, we expect the heroes to come out on top and in the end defeat the bad guy, especially when looking at something like a series finale. However, this is just not the case this time. Divatox, the main antagonist of Turbo, has hired a monstrous being known as Gold Goyle to destroy the Turbo Megazord, and he actually does. He completely destroys the thing, the most powerful Zord of all time. Luckily, the Megazord is able to destroy Gold Goyle in a last minute effort, but the Power Rangers victory is anything but joyful. They are powerless and have lost one of the few things that gave them an upper hand. To make matters worse, they learn that their mentor and leader, Zordon, has been defeated and kidnapped. The series ends with the Power Rangers completely zapped of their power and beginning their journey into the unknown to find and rescue Zordon. This is a rather dark ending for an otherwise action-packed kid show full of over-the-top villains and clear merchandising tie-ins. The heroes that should always win didn't. The Power Rangers are gone, their giant robot is destroyed, and their leader is missing. I guess they're just the Rangers now. Terra loses her memories. The series finale of the original Teen Titans is rather depressing. The episode is aptly named Things Change, and well, a lot of things change in this episode, in ways that not only make you think of the context of the show, but how it relates to our personal lives. In the season 2 finale, Terra, an anti-hero and a love interest to Beast Boy, sacrificed herself to stop Slade, and must turn herself into a statue to do so. However, in the series finale, Beast Boy sees a girl that looks and sounds exactly like Terra. After finding that her statue is gone, he becomes convinced that she has returned. However, after talking with her, he finds that she has no recollection of her past, no memories, nothing. He desperately tries to get her to remember, showing her things she used to like and recalling memories they shared, but nothing works and it seems like she has become a completely different person. Don't you remember anything from before? I just remember high school. You used to live in the desert before joining the Teen Titans. You couldn't control your powers at first. Then Slade helped you, and you wanted to take over the city. But in the end, you couldn't go through with it, and you saved us all. Why would you want to be friends with someone who has so much trouble? Because I know who she really is. Becoming more and more frustrated, Beast Boy throws mud at Terra in an attempt to get her to use her powers. This backfires though, and leads her to storm off upset. He later goes to the theme park where they used to hang out, but is encountered by Slade. Beast Boy accuses Slade of wiping Terra's memories, but he denies his involvement in the situation. While the two fight, Beast Boy yells that he won't let Slade hurt Terra again, but Slade responds that he is the one hurting her. He needs to let her go. Eventually, it's revealed that this Slade is just a robotic duplicate. Later, Beast Boy sees her again at school. He tries one last time to get her to remember, but he's unsuccessful. He wonders why things can't go back to the way they were, but Terra tells him that things were never the way he remembered them as. Why can't things just go back to the way they were? You were so happy then. Things changed, Beast Boy. The girl you want me to be is just a memory. The bell rings and she fades away into the crowd, leaving Beast Boy standing there all alone. While well, there is a TV movie that comes afterwards serving as the true finale of the series, this is still technically the last episode, in the last appearance of Terra. There is no resolution, nor a happy ending. People change, and sometimes we see the past through rose-colored glasses. We don't always get resolutions in life, and no other children's show has shown this stronger than Teen Titans. Scoutmaster Lumpus just turns out to be a random, insane man. Camp Lazlo was a weird show. Like, really weird. 
to be fair, most Cartoon Network shows in the 2000s were. I mean, these were the years that gave us Flapjack. But Camp Lazo takes the cake with its strange, hilarious, and seriously messed up finale titled Lumpus' Last Stand. The episode starts out as silly as usual, with Scoutmaster Lumpus getting sick of doing laundry and allowing all the campers to start painting on their clothes instead. It turns out that this is such a revolutionary idea that people start to award Lumpus. Some time travelers even arrive from a thousand years in the future, claiming that this innovation, this idea of painting on your clothes, cured world hunger and brought about an era of peace. By freeing us from laundry, you gave us time to solve world hunger! And civilization has enjoyed a millennium of prosperity and enlightenment! Things seem almost too good to be true, and they are, because a rain cloud comes and washes away all the paint. Everyone leaves disgusted, and the time travelers become much skinnier, showing that their present time has changed as a result. And if that wasn't weird enough for a finale, things are about to get a whole lot weirder. An elderly version of Heifer from Rocco's Modern Life arrives with the cops at the camp claiming that Lumpus had locked him away for the entire season and fooled everyone into believing that he was the real Scoutmaster. What? He's an imposter, a fake, and worse, he is no Scoutmaster of Camp Kidney! What? Yeah, I mean, so? Lumpus then gets put into a straitjacket and is carried away to a mental institution. The campers then stand there in the middle of town, naked, and just taking in the fact that their scoutmaster was actually some random weirdo off the streets. That's it. That's the end. This brings up a whole lot of dark implications, with an unknown older man who was not hired by the camp to be in charge of, or left alone with, a bunch of children. Since this is a kid's show, nothing of that sort actually happened, but the possibilities are rather chilling. And why was Heifer there? Joe Murray, the creator of Camp Lazo, also made Rocco's Modern Life, but it's just kind of weird that he showed up in the first place because Laszlo aired on Cartoon Network and Rocco aired on Nickelodeon. I'm not sure what kind of legal trade-off had to happen to make this possible, but it couldn't have been easy. Was it worth it? I'll leave that up to you. Alf gets taken away by the US military. Alf was an interesting cultural icon in the late 80s. Despite being an ugly, alien, big thing, he endeared audiences around the country, and also got a shitload of merchandise. There were even ALF trading cards, and you can't forget those ALF pogs. I love that episode. ALF pogs? Remember ALF? He's back! In pog form! You traded my soul for pogs?! So, people got pretty attached to ALF over the years, especially children. So how did they choose to end the series? With ALF getting taken away by the military, to be dissected of course. In the finale, titled Consider Me Gone, Alf receives a radio transmission from some of his friends back on his home planet of Melmac. They tell him that they've purchased a new planet and want his help in creating a new civilization there. Here, I made this for you. Here's us on Earth, and here's you on your new planet. We're really not all that far away from each other. Thanks, B. Goodbye, Alf. We'll always be best friends. However, the alien task force of the US military intercept the transmission, and Alf is captured by them before he can head home. From the very first episode, the alien task force made their intentions very clear, with plans to burn, freeze, electrocute, poison, physically torture, and dissect him. We'll see how it responds to intense heat, freezing cold, high voltage, toxic substances, pain, <laughs> sleep deprivation, inoculation, that's needles, and of course, dissection. Jesus Christ. And the show ends just like that, leaving it up for all the children watching to imagine these terrible things happening. Now, turns out, this wasn't actually meant to be the finale of the series. The showrunners intentionally ended it on a cliffhanger in hopes that the network would pick up the series for one final season. Well, it didn't work. And thanks to their stupid decision, Alf is now cut up into tiny pieces. Well, not really. 
Six years later, a TV movie titled Project Alf aired that showed that Alf is still alive, but is on death row with a scheduled execution. While he does end up escaping, he never sees his human friends from the series ever again. The movie didn't go over well with fans, with many of them outright ignoring it and considering it non-canon. When your film is so universally disliked by fans that they'd rather have the canon ending be Alf getting tortured to death, you know you did something wrong. This is a stick from the roof of our garage. The garage that you crashed into almost four years ago now. To Elf, if you ever drop in again, please use the front door. <laughs> Love the tanners. Thanks, guys. David and Lisa naturally die. If you grew up in the early 90s, then you may remember the world of David the Gnome. What, you don't? Well, that's okay, most people don't. The program was initially produced in Spain, with the English dub being produced by the Canadian company Cookie Jar Entertainment, and being released on Nickelodeon in 1987 as a part of their then-new programming block, Nick Jr. The series follows two gnomes, David and his wife Lisa, and their good friend Swift the Fox. Their adventures are small and simple, and they usually spend their time repairing damages caused by humans and outsmarting nasty trolls. Oh, uh, also gnomes have the power of mind control and telepathy, so they have that going for them too. David and Lisa spent their days making new friends and helping those in need, right up until the end of the series where they both die. Yep, the two main characters die at the end of this Nick Jr. show. In the episode titled The Mountains of Beyond, David and Lisa prepare to travel up into the mountains as they realize that their time on Earth is coming to an end. You see, gnomes can only live to be 400, and David and Lisa are both 399 years old throughout the series, with their imminent birthdays coming up around the finale. They bid a sorrowful farewell to all their animal friends and set off with Swift, traveling with them. However, when they reach the base of the mountain, they tell Swift that he cannot climb the mountain with them, and that they must say goodbye there. Well, Swift, old friend, I'm afraid the time has come for us to part. We've been through so much together, you and I, good times and bad, and you were always there to carry me out of danger. I love you very much, Swift. They make it to the top of the mountain and pass away in each other's arms as their bodies turn into apple trees. Swift heads down the mountain, heartbroken and alone. Farewell, my dear David, my husband, my love. Farewell, my beloved. I thank you for all the love you've given me. While it's important that children know that every living thing must eventually die, perhaps a show about a happy gnome and a fox isn't the best way to show it. Especially when said gnome is holding his wife with tears in his eyes, repeatedly saying, It's time. Yeesh, a bit heavy for the five preschoolers that watch this, don't you think? I think the time has come. Yes, it's here. It's here. Yes. Everyone fucking dies in dinosaurs. We've covered some pretty dark series finale so far. Dealing with death, losing those around you, and existential crisis. But how about one that deals with all three and then some? If you're into that, then look no further than the series finale for dinosaurs. The show is a parody of human life, showing dinosaurs living in suburbia in a live action sitcom. Yeah, live action. The entire show was done with puppets created by the Jim Henson Company and was conceived right before his death. Many were reportedly freaked out by these puppets, and rightfully so. While they are pretty uncomfortable to look at, they were another technical marvel made possible by Jim Henson, with all the facial movements of the dinosaurs being controlled by a series of animatronics. So how exactly would one end a family-friendly series about dinosaurs? Could you just let them live and let the inevitable rise of death of the species go by unmentioned? Of course not. We gotta kill them off. 
In the series finale Changing Nature, the main dinosaur family, the Sinclars, are having a picnic awaiting the return of the Bunch Beetles. Well, Katie, it's mere moments until the Bunch Beetles return in what can only be described as a spectacular panoply of color. Bunch Beetles eat those pesky cider poppies that grow so abundantly this time of year. However, the beetles don't return, as a plastic food factory has been built over top of their breeding grounds. And without the beetles in the ecosystem, the vines that the beetles ate begin to overgrow, and the whole planet begins to fall out of line. So in an effort to stop the vines, the dinosaurs kill off all plant life on the planet. Then, in an effort to revive the plants, they drop bombs in the volcanoes hoping that rain clouds will form. Well, that whole plant backfires and causes the beginning of the Ice Age. We then get treated to the final scene of the series, where the family sits around in winter coats, desperately trying to get warm. The father, Earl, apologizes to his family, saying that he shouldn't have taken nature for granted. The family accepts their fate and stays together until the end, as the snow continues to fall outside. So yeah, that's, that, that's, that's dinosaurs, everybody. The episode plays this completely straight and doesn't cheapen in the experience with any jokes. They are committed here, and it shows. The chilling nature of this episode doesn't just come from the context of the show, but also the implications it has on the human race. When the baby dinosaur asks his father what's going to happen, he says, Dinosaurs have been on this earth for 150 million years, and it's not like we're going to just disappear. Except they do, and the same exact thing could happen to us if we're not careful. This is a cautionary tale showing that there was a race of intelligent beings on this planet before us, and they died out because they took it for granted, and we're no different. And if we allow history to repeat itself, well then we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Now obviously dinosaurs didn't cause the ice age and they weren't living in suburban homes having cookouts, but the message is still clear. Don't fuck with nature.